us uh, wherever you are uh, around the world. You're finding us at goodlifetelevision.org. We can see that. We're so grateful. Uh, I think in the we've been doing this about a year and a half. Uh, and I checked the other day. I think there's about goodlifetelevision.org. I think about 80 to 85,000 of you have found us there from like 100 countries. It's amazing. So we welcome you. We bless you. And we're here to talk about the good stuff. We're dwelling on the good stuff. And boy, do I have a good guest today. Uh, Father Larry Goslin is with me, Father. Dean, it's just such a joy to be here and, and to promoting the good life, all that yes. you represent. And you do that so well. Thank you. It's such a beautiful way you represent well, such goodness you. to everyone. Well, you too. Uh, Father Larry, I want to introduce you just for the people that are watching outside of Santa Barbara. A lot of people in Santa Barbara where we're sitting no, Father Larry, uh, but he's a Franciscan friar of the province of St. Barbara. He's a native of Washington State, he, but he's a friar of the world. He's, he's currently serving in parochial ministry here at Old Mission Santa Barbara, which is pretty close to where we're sitting. Um, Mission Santa Barbara is the 10th of the 21 Alta California missions. It was established in December of 1786 by the Spanish Franciscans. It's the longest running active mission and is home to a community of Franciscan friars. And Father Larry's known in our community. He's beloved in our community. And so it's so great to, to have him. I wanted to start with just being a Franciscan friar. Now, I, I was reading about this, and my understanding is, is that this is a Franciscan tradition began over 800 years ago by St. Francis of Assisi. Is that right? Correct, yes. Uh -huh. Francis of Assisi, or Francis Bernardoni was his family name, lived in Assisi, uh, was born in a very wealthy family, and, uh, and then decided to give that all up to follow Christ completely. And so he gave up everything, shed everything that he owned or possessed, and took the life of a pover, of a poor, of a poor person, of a, and, uh, and so uh, followed wow. Christ in a life of poverty and simplicity but also joy and peace. He was a real uh, instrument of peace to, to everyone that he met. Well, fascinating. So, so yeah. that's the lineage kind of of this. For 800 years, there's been folks that have committed to this life. Yes, we're worldwide order. And there's probably about 40,000 of us through the world. So uh, there's three branches of the Franciscan family, what we call it. Uh, and we're, we're one of that. We're, we're the original, actually, the original root of going back to Francis himself. So, wow. And Francis never intended to start an order. He just intended for himself personally to follow Christ. And then people were attracted to him and came to him and wanted to join him. So he had no intentions of starting anything. Isn't that amazing? Himself. I think this is the same with Jesus. He didn't intend to start a religion. <laughs> yes. But yet people followed him because of, you know. It's yes. amazing people like that, that that when they do something and it's bold and it's courageous and it's beautiful how it attracts others D doesn't it it's so attractive yeah. people want to come and follow when they see the authenticity of a life especially yeah. a life shared in christ but anyone of yeah. goodness yeah when did you decide to do this uh, you know i was a little bit later in life i was 24 when i actually entered so i had served uh in the u.s military prior to that and um, then wanted to do something different with my life so uh, I did feel a call I think sometimes we we discern a call in our life that God was calling me to this yeah. and this is something that not just that I wanted but that God was calling me and I was receptive to following that so so at 24 I entered and uh, uh, so that was kind of the beginning of it and wow uh, and that's been 40 it's been 46 years, actually. 46 yeah. years now. Okay. I, 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 I love reading about you and reading this, but I, I was, I'll just read a little bit of this. Um, As minister, he's experienced Christ on the streets with the homeless in Seattle, on Indian reservations of the Southwest, among indigenous people of Mexico, alongside the poor of India, and then in parochial ministry in varied settings. In all places, he's come to know home among the people of God. Love for life's adventures and faith has taken him various places. It's been an adventure, hasn't it? It's been an incredible adventure. I would have never imagined this for myself as a young man, <laughs> that this is where I would be at in, in, in this point in my life and through my life. So, yeah. so uh, as Franciscans, we choose to serve the poor. 
so we have a special outreach to the poor. And so um, that was, uh, you, you know, an opportunity that I had to really live in places where there is, you know, a, a, a lower economic living standard. You know? Yes. So, uh, but that's where we find our joy. And that's where we find, you know, what yeah. what is us to be called as Franciscans. Yeah. So. I had a mentor one time tell me, if you follow Christ long enough, he'll lead you to the poor. That's beautiful, Dean. Isn't it true? Isn't it I, true? I, I think that's where we find the, 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 the real face of Christ. Yeah. you know in, in in poverty and not just material poverty but any kind of right. poverty that that's associated with us you know yes. it can be a very much uh, spiritual poverty as well yes and there can but, be a lot of spiritual poverty in places where there's not material poverty yes. Yes. i mean i think and and i think that poverty is a reliance on god when we when we know we have just god to trust and, and there's a blessedness in that as the beatitudes express to us yes you know so isn't that beautiful you know, this program's called Good Life. You know, we, we the, the goal here is to dwell on the good. There's so much happening, there's so much. Life on Earth is not a picnic, yes. you know, especially these days, it's been, it's yes. been difficult. And a lot of people, there's a lot of struggles and, and we don't ignore those. But, you know, the Bible talks about what you dwell on, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is excellent, whatever is, you know, beautiful, dwell on these things. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Yes. And so I think we have a choice. And when I was reading about your your work and who you are, there's there seems to be a simplicity and a joy that you've tasted and experienced and that you certainly give to other people through who you are. But talk about that. Talk about your walk of faith and and joy. First of all, I think it it begins with the people of God are holy and the people of God are good. And we know that from God, that God created everything out of goodness. Yes. And so to enter into that fully or as much as we can, at some point we're going to experience God. And when we experience God, we're going to experience joy. I, I, mm. I, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I realize I'm very, very blessed. I'm grateful that I've been able to experience the joy that you're talking about in many ways. And I, I hope and pray that I can extend that to others, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do think joy is a gift from God and uh, it's something that God, I think, imbues within us so that God's manifestations can be brought into the world. Yes. So, so if I do that, I'm grateful. Uh, but, but, but thank you for saying that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it feels like in the world oftentimes people are chasing happiness or chasing feelings when what you were talking about here is the fruit of connection to God bringing a deep joy. It seems, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because it seems to me that that deep rooted joy of being connected to God is different than fleeting happiness. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I think when we, we think about happiness, we often identify it with materialism in some ways. Something's going to make you happy, whatever, uh, a person, a thing, or some, uh, 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 claiming something. But when we talk about joy, it's, it's not an accumulation. It's, uh, and especially in our Christian, but especially our Franciscan, it's a letting go. It's, it's, a, it's a renunciation, in a sense, of, of that, so that God can be all. Uh, and, and, and not these material things. It's not a material happiness, but it's an interior joy that's embedded in the person. That, that's a pure gift. And it, it, comes, it comes as a gift. Yeah. It's nothing you've earned, nothing. It, it, it's just given to you by right. God because, because of your receptivity of spirit and heart. When you're open, when you don't have uh, things to distract from that, that then, then you're given the gift of joy. Yeah, that's so good. Um, does it start with surrender? I mean, would you say a person who who doesn't know God, who's watching this, who's really struggling, is how would you talk to that person about starting a relationship with God? Does it is is surrender kind of the starting point, or how do you when you're talking to someone new who's who's struggling, he says, "I don't know God." What do you say? You know, I I think surrender would be. A later point. I don't think you can talk to someone 
uh, initially about surrendering to God if, if they don't know God at that point. But maybe, maybe reliance on God or, or, or something beyond themselves, asking them to look beyond themselves. Or, but uh, I, I mean, from my standpoint, I think surrender comes at a later point of conversion where you can say, I, I do surrender my life to God. I, I'm, I, I give myself to God completely, fully. You know, God, use me as you will. Mm. I, I, I think that's a later step of conversion. I think, I think initially you have to know goodness. You have to know peace. And you have to know that, first of all, that you are loved. I, yes. I think that, that's a constant yes. struggle in all of our lives, to know that we are loved by God. And, yes. and to know that is an incredible gift. And to know it and to believe it, that I'm loved yeah. by God. And do you know Brennan Manning? Have you heard that name? Yes, I do. Irish, isn't he? An yes. Irish, yes, Irish poet, isn't he? He was no, a no. speaker, he yes. was a writer. He wrote a book called uh, yes. The do. Ragamuffin Gospel. Yes, I do know that. One book. of my favorites. Is it really? Is oh, that really? I love Brendan Manning. And Brendan Manning, and he, he would talk about being the beloved. Yes. Life is the beloved. We're loved as we are, not as we should be. That was his kind of signature phrase. You're loved right as you are, not as you should be. Um, and that's such a great point that having that experience of the beloved, I'm the I'm God's beloved. I'm He loves me. Is a life changing experience, it's, isn't it? It's a life changing experience. Yes. It changes everything. Yes. Yeah. A and that is the reality that we are born into in Christ. That that's the reality. That's that's the foundational point. Of, of our adoption into Christ, mm. but but we, we do lose sight of that. We can lose sight so easy of that, but we have to yeah. always call ourselves back to that. Yeah. A, a, and again, it, so it, it comes as grace, and grace is unearned and it's just given to us freely. Yes. So, grace but, is but, a wonderful but, thing. Yes, isn't it's grace. Is a <laughs> grace is a good thing. <laughs> so Thank what, God for grace. Isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? Grace and mercy. Yes. I've had a couple experiences in my life where I Tell me. had an encounter with the mercy of God. I, I was, it was one time, it was a dark time, and, and I was just at my wit's end. And I had this experience, I was in a cabin by myself on the floor, face down. Were you <laughs> and, I, and I had an encounter with the mercy of God that I, it was a, I mean, it's hard to explain. You're going to think I'm crazy, but, you know, they already do. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, a, it was a true, I, I just call it an encounter with mercy because that's what it was. I felt this presence and this peace and forgiveness. And, you know, they, they say that somebody defined mercy as not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Huh. But I, I, had yes. that, I had that experience, and I, and I realized, you know, when you encounter mercy, the mercy of God, that's also like a life-changing moment. Yes, yes. You know? Yes. And to bring that to others, first of all, to feel that within ourselves, but then to be able to bring that to others yeah. is, is a great gift of joy, again. You know? Yeah. And it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Thank you, Dean, for sharing that about mercy. That's so beautiful oh, okay. in your experience. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, I love seeing you in the community. You know, we'll see you at social events. Or I told, I said before we came on, I, last time I saw you were on the dance floor together. Uh, but I love that you're out there. You're with the people, you know, and and you're so beloved. I love. I just love that you're out. I don't know if all friars do this, but I, I haven't seen many. But it, but you're right in, with the people, aren't you? You, you know, first of all, Dean, I love Santa Barbara and I love this community. This is an incredible community. We have something here that's very, very special. And, and I think we use it well, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we use it very, very well. So it's a great joy for me to be out in the community with, with, with this, this wonderful people here. Uh, I, I'm probably a little more extroverted than maybe some friars in that <laughs> regard. 
<laughs> but, but, we need but, extra but, room but, but I think the Franciscan community has told me, Larry, just be who you are. In fact, yeah. when, I was, when I was initially asked to come here, I, I asked, why, why are you sending me to Santa Barbara? And they said, Larry, because we want you to spread your wings and fly, and we want you just to be Larry in Santa Barbara. And I said, I can, I can do that. I love it. I love it. I want to talk about a couple of your books. You've done writing. You've done uh, poetry. And this, this latest book, Landscapes, Ballad of a Franciscan Troubadour, what a fantastic title is. Father Larry's latest book. This is kind of a memoir. Tell us about this. Yeah, I, I did that during the pandemic. You know, we kind of didn't have much to do. So right. <laughs> this is kind of my pandemic project. Yeah. And 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 a, a couple of people encouraged me. You should you should write something about you. So I sat down and I started writing, and I, I really got inspired. So, but I didn't want to write about myself. But I instead I wanted to write about places that I have been in my life, huh. and and how. Places, landscapes have touched me with the presence of God in different in different expressions. So I picked 20 places. First of all, growing up, I'm from Washington State. Growing up as in a little community, a little farming community under Mount Rainier, and and how that the land and the people kind of influenced me. And then and then going on to different places that I've been that I've. Uh, Living, I've lived in New Mexico. I worked with the indigenous people, the um, Apache Indian people in, in New Mexico and in Mexico and, and different places where I've really experienced th the goodness of God. I, I have a chapter there. I have 20 chapters. So I have a chapter there on France and talking about mercy. I had an experience, I think like you're, you were describing about mercy in France. Mm. And I was just in the middle of a field uh, in the southern part of France it was in a place called Lourdes, which is the sacred shrine for, for uh, uh, us Catholics. I had an overwhelming sense, uh, I, I think, like you described, of the mercy of God. And really? it, came, it came to me. And it was life-changing. It was oh. life-changing. And at that point, I knew my life had changed. And I knew my life had been given to me as a gift. Mm. And I knew that I had to give this gift back to others. Oh. And that was incredibly free, freeing. Yeah. and uh, energizing from a spiritual oh, standpoint. So that's in here. So, yes. 20, so 20 lands, 20, 20 places yeah, yeah. that Father Larry's been, Father Larry Gosselin's latest book. Um, talk about your experience in India so. and, and Mother Teresa. And, and, and I, I saw this other, uh, this is another book, I've Been Waiting for You. Uh, and it's a personal and spiritual journey with St. Teresa of Calcutta. Tell us about that. So uh, it's kind of a long story, but I, I had a premonition, if you would, that somehow I was to go to Calcutta, India, and to uh, assist Mother Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I never thought that how that would happen, but but it anyway it, it ended up happening, and I did come to the door of the Missionaries of Charity there in Calcutta, and this little old sister came out to greet me, and I actually didn't recognize her at first. And then it was Mother Teresa, and she really? said to me, "I've been waiting for you to come." So, so that's a, that was the title of the book, um, and uh, I, I had the opportunity of growing very close to her. She was sick at the time, and that was part of my premonition: is that she was sick, and somehow I was to be at her side, and and that's actually what ended up happening. And wow. so, uh, um, we grew very close during that time. And she went into surgery, and the doctors actually thought maybe she couldn't survive the surgery. And I was with her in hours, you know, minutes before the surgery, and gave her the sacraments of the church, confession, and and the anointing of the sick. And oh uh, my goodness! And so we, we we just had a very very special friendship and a bond. I we remained close, very close friends after that. After I left, and we used to talk on the phone probably once a month. We would call each other. And uh, when she died, um, I was heartbroken. I heard it over the news. Mother Teresa just died. And I immediately knew I needed to go to Calcutta. I was in New Mexico at the time. So I asked permission if I could get a flight to Calcutta. And my provincial said, yes, Larry, you go and you tell them that we're sending you there. Mm -hmm. And so I went there with some kind of idea that I just had to be there with her and 
uh, to make a long story short, they ended. They asked me to do the final blessing on her body before we put it in the ground there. So I oh did the final. Goodness. So uh, I feel a real closeness with her. I I don't know. It's something. Um, it's something very very special. I you know. I, I, actually, when I wrote this book, I, I I made a vow to God when I left Calcutta because there was a. I, there was a lot of love between myself and mother. I think we felt very, very close. And I, I told myself I would never write or anything about this because it was too sacred and it was too private, that, I, that this was meant to be just kept under, under taps. Uh, prior to her canonization, I, I, I was driving back from Phoenix, Arizona, and I felt she spoke to me and she said, well, however, in, interiorly, that you, you you are to write about your really and I thought no I would not, and she said no no and I wrote this book in 40 days and it ended up in the hands of Pope Francis 80 days after after I first started see it we, we got it published in 40 days uh, we, I wrote it in 40 days and in 40 days after that it was published and the first copy ended up in the hands of Pope Francis in Rome uh, no so, way. so there was something kind of uh, it's been translated into Spanish and also Polish, and uh, we're trying to translate it into Hindi. And we're not making money. All the money goes to the missionaries of charity, so it's not like a money making. Yeah, but, but, but it's just uh, wow. it was my way of honoring her and my remembrance of her. Wow. So we yeah. had some very intimate conversations in the course of my time with her. What did you talk about? If you can tell us, uh, you, you know, some some of it was kind of just ordinary. I, I she would come in. My, I had a little room off the chapel there, and they would bring breakfast in to me in the morning. The sisters, she would come in and say, "Do you mind if I sit down and have breakfast?" <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so we would sometimes just talk about the day, and you know, it was the simple little things. And uh, th wow. then, uh, then once she asked me a question, she she had something she had written about how we are to thirst for Christ because that's very much in the inspiration of Mother Teresa, our thirst for Christ. Mm -hmm. And she said, she showed me something she had written how we are to thirst for Christ. And, and she said, what do you think of that? And I said, oh, it's very beautiful. And she said, so I want you to preach on that for an hour tomorrow. To the whole community. Really? <laughs> so I had a day to prepare this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> anyway, so we, we kind of talked about different things. Just uh, Wow. We actually talked a lot about her health because I felt I was sent there to encourage her to go forward in her health. And I, I felt I had a purpose there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, one day, the president of Ireland, Mrs. Robinson, came to visit, and she wanted to meet with Mother Teresa. And the big thing at that time was uh, she was promoting abor abortions in Ireland. And, of course, she came there, and, of course, Mother stood very strongly against that. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I was going out that morning, and Mother said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to go anoint this lady who was sick. And she said, no, no, I want you right here when you meet Mrs. Robinson. And I want you to tell her we don't want any abortions in Ireland. Really? <laughs> so, so they came up. The BBC was filming this. It was a big publicity thing. And uh, did you set it? And so uh, m m the Mrs. Robinson came and she saw Mother there, and I was standing next to her. And she kind of looked at me, and then Mother said, "And this is Father Larry." And she kind of glanced at me and looked back. She said, "Now, Father Larry, you tell her." <laughs> You tell her what I told you. No way. <laughs> and so, so <laughs> anyway, and then we took Mrs. Robinson and we prayed in the chapel for the people of Ireland. And oh we, we were going to pray gosh. for them. We we're going to pray for Ireland. So anyway, those are some of the stories you know, it's amazing. that I recall. Mother Teresa, speaking of a, of a life, I mean, she was a little woman, wasn't she? She was a very little woman. And she was a powerhouse. I mean, she was. I remember she came to the National Prayer Breakfast one time. Did I think. she? And she spoke, and she had world leaders quaking in their boots. You know, Bill Clinton is over there, and all these, and this little four foot eight or whatever. I don't know how. She she took the room, and you could tell who had the power. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't the politicians. Yes. I mean, in, in, in a life sold out to God, emptied of self, it's amazing what can happen. I mean, what happened in this little. We're still talking about Mother Teresa here. She's yes. been gone 23 years or whatever. Yeah, we're still talking about her. We're still her. talking about her. And when we talk about goodness, people will say, well, it's like Mother Teresa. I mean, it's like there's a consciousness there about 
the, the witness of her life is still very much in our remembrance. Oh. I wanted to say too, I think I saw her at very vulnerable times in her life. And I was at her side uh, when she was very sick in the hospital. And actually my premonition of her was that she was gonna be fine. And the doctors in Calcutta said, you probably won't last this surgery. And I think I came to her side and I told her no. She told me, she said, you have to tell Jesus that I can't die. And I said, Mother, you're, you're not going to die. You're, you're going to be fine. And really? I think, I think there was a reassurance anyway. That's, that's you good. anointed Mother Teresa. Yes. Now that's something not a lot of people can say. Yes, I yes. Oh and my it goodness. It was such a gift. What a spectacular experience. Amazing. Man, get the book. I'm going to read this today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, last thing, we only have a minute left. You know, one of my favorite hashtags, I guess you should say, <laughs> is God is good. Yes. And all the time. And, you know, we've been through some tr some trials and we, you know, we had a daughter with a lot of problems and a special needs daughter and we've been through. And one of the things that's kept coming back in my life is the simplicity of the truth that God is good. Yeah. When life's not good, circumstances aren't good, whatever the situation may be, God is good. God hasn't changed. Yeah. What's been your experience with the goodness of God? First of all, I would have to say, I think sometimes we equate God is good with, or, or life is good with life is easy. Life is not easy. Life is not easy. No, no. And so the goodness of God comes through, sometimes precisely through the difficulties of life, where we, where we come to those places of total reliance on God that we maybe have, that, that's what we have to rely on. Mm. So, so the, the goodness of God, at this point in my life, and I'm 73 years old, I am overwhelmed in the goodness of God. Mm. And it's, 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 it's like it's always there. I, I don't know uh, how I got to this point, but it's there. And, and I, I'm just so grateful for it. It's, it's like an undercurrent of my very life. And I'm not saying that about myself, but I think anyone who, who ascribes to follow Christ will, will come to that point. But it doesn't mean life is easy. And we certainly see so much in our world today that is disconcerting. I right. mean, you know, it's not that, that life is easy, but, but, but there is a goodness. Yes. And I think we have to focus in on that, have that as our foundational principle in our life, that there is goodness here. Yes. And that, that goodness will overcome any difficulties in yes. the end. And so we have to be strong. We have to be very, very strong, and we have to be courageous in our beliefs. We can't be intimidated. Oh, we can't be intimidated it. by the yes. things of this world. I love yeah. it. Preach. <laughs> the goodness of God. So you can be stripped in the suffering of the difficulty, can kind of strip you, and you can actually encounter the goodness of God in a deeper way than you would have if you hadn't suffered. I think so. I think you can, you can uh, encounter that goodness in a deeper way. Yeah. And I think God does that to us. He tears away different layers where we can go deeper and deeper into that great mystery. That is the foundational point of our life, you know, yes. that there is goodness. But we have to be stripped and we have right. to be willing to be stripped. Right. And it's going to come at a cost. It's not going to be free. Yeah. But, but, but it's going to be an overwhelming gift. That's and, beautiful. We're going to have you back. Oh, I'd love that. I would love that. Dean, and it's a privilege to be with you, a Thank man you. Of, of great, great faith, Thank and I, I respect you greatly. Thank, Thank you for, for all that you, you represent and all that you are. Thank you, sir. It's great to be with you. Great to be with this you. This is really fun. I love this. <laughs> we'll see you next time.